Good morning. So uh, let us start general microbiology. The first topic will be the history. Among history, I will discuss the important eminent microbiologist. To start with Louis Pasteur. Louis Pasteur, again, he is known as the father of microbiology. He has contributed various things like he has discovered the method of pasteurization of milk. Fermentation principles. He has also laid down the germ theory of life. Various sterilization principles like autoclave, hot air oven, all this, the basic principle was laid down by Louis Pasteur. He has discovered the various vaccines like cholera vaccine, anthrax vaccine, rabies vaccine. Not the vaccines which are in use now, but the first stage of the vaccines for cholera, anthrax and rabies are discovered by uh, Louis Pasteur. Of course, now those are much modified and the later advanced vaccines are used. So these are the various contributions laid down by Louis Pasteur. And the second eminent microbiologist is Robert Koch. Robert Koch. And he is also very popular in the field of uh, microbiology. Many authors, the name Robert Koch is the father of modern microbiology. He has also laid down various principles like he has used solid media for use of bacterial culture. He has feared, first time he has isolated bacteria in pure culture. He has developed the concept that we can isolate the bacteria into in pure culture. Hanging drug for bacterial motility demonstration. Again the principle was laid down by Robert Koch. He has also introduced the staining technique. He has told that by staining we, uh, we can demonstrate the bacteria in much better way. Aniline dye he has used first. Aniline dye he had used first. And the most popular uh, discovery of Robert Koch is Koch postulate and Koch phenomena. First, I will tell you about Koch phenomena. It was uh, demonstrated in tuberculosis. They say that uh, injection of the TB antigen, crude TB antigen, in susceptible in guinea pigs leads to development of induration. Induration of crude tuberculous antigen in susceptible guinea pigs. Guinea pigs leads to a development of induration which he has named as Koch phenomenon. What is Koch postulate? Koch postulate was the most important uh, uh, contribution of Robert Koch. Koch postulate tells about the association of a bacteria with a disease. They say, it says that a microbes is said to be linked with a disease, said to be the causative agent of a disease, if four criteria are fulfilled. The first criteria is the microbes should be constantly associated with the disease. There should be constant association of the microbes with the disease. Second is you should be able to isolate the microbes from the clinical sample. From the clinical sample of the patient, you should be able to isolate the microbe. When you inject the microbe into experimental animal, it should produce similar disease. 
and you should be re isolate you should be able to re isolate the microbes from the experimental animals you should be able to re isolate the microbe from the samples of experimental animals so these are the four postulates under cost of postulate later on the fifth criteria was introduced by uh, his followers and according to this they say that there should be antibody production also against the microbes against the bacteria there should be antibody uh, production so serological response is the fifth criteria which was introduced later of course now molecular cost postulate has been laid down currently molecular cost postulate has been laid down and according to this it is the gene of the microbe rather than the microbe per se which should be constantly associated with the disease according to this it is the gene of the microbe it is a virulent gene of the microbe rather than the microbe per se should be constantly associated with the disease manifestation so this is about molecular cost postulate okay so these are the various uh, contributions by robert koch then we can discuss the third eminent microbiologist that is paul elrich paul elrich again has laid down various a contribution like he is the inventor of uh, acid fasting he is also known as father of chemotherapy as he has discovered a drug called as salvarsan for the treatment of syphilis the salvarsan was a drug which was called as magic bullet because it was the first drug which was used for great part of infectious diseases hence he was known as father of uh, chemotherapy he is also introduced the side chain theory of antibody production elbridge phenomena which is a toxin anti toxin phenomena especially uh, demonstrated for diphtheria toxin this was experimented on diphtheria uh, toxin so it was known as elbridge phenomena elbridgea is a rickettsia group of microorganism which was named after paul elbridge elbridgea okay so these are the various contributions of paul elbridge other contributors like edward jenner he was known as the father of vaccine vaccinology he had discovered the first vaccine that is vaccine for smallpox by using cowpox he has used cowpox strains cowpox virus to vaccinate against smallpox other important contributors like anthony von leonak he is the inventor of simple microscope then raska e raska is the inventor of electron microscope electron microscope kerry b mullis kerry b mullis is the inventor of pcr polymerase chain reaction john collar is the inventor of collar is the inventor of monoclonal antibody he has discovered monoclonal antibody so these are the some of the important contributors in the field of microbiology which you can remember there are various organisms which are named after the micro organism uh, the uh, the microbiologists like uh, for example koch wick bacillus yes timophilus egypticus so there are various organisms named after the discoverers then cleblophilus bacillus corine bacillus diphtheria 
ओके ईटन्स एजेंट माइकोप्लाज्मा पिफस बेसिस the detailed list is there in your in your book. You can have a look. I am just outlining the important ones. So the uh, it is the Haemophilus influenza, which is called as Pfeffer's bacillus. Okay, so there are various microorganisms named after the discoverers. Fine. So this is all about history. Then I will tell you a bit about bacterial taxonomy. There are three way. the bacteria can be classified to say that the classification of a uh, uh, bacteria can be done by three way three ways the uh, the most conventional uh, method is phylogenetic classification according to phylogenetic classification they say that it is a branching tree like classification it is a hierarchical arrangement of the microorganism resembling a branching tree like pattern at each node there is a weight character to classify like for example the bacteria can be classified based upon the shape into cocci and bacilli each based upon the gram stain you can classify into gram positive in and gram negative gram positive cocci gram negative cocci gram positive bacilli gram negative bacilli so the shape of the bacteria has a higher uh, weightage than gram staining uh, property of the bacteria so this is called as a hierarchical classification of the bacteria resembling into a branching tree like pattern and at each node at each node there is a uh, character to Uh, classify the bacteria, and each character ha ha having a particular weight is. So this is the most popular, and this is the most practical classification. Later on, there was one more classification introduced called as phenetic classification. Phenetic or Addisonian, as it was discovered by Michael Addison, hence it was called as Addisonian classification or phenetic classification. according to this it has it has given all character equal weights they say that why to give more weights to a, to a particular character it may be arbitrary because this weighing characteristic is is totally arbitrary whichever uh, character you are thinking having more weights you just blindly give more weights so why to give arbitrarily more uh, more weightage to some character and less weightage to some character so according to this phenetic or addisonian classification all characters are, are given equal weightage and this classification is basically used in numeric taxonomy numeric uh, uh, taxonomy and the third and the most acceptable classification is molecular classification which classifies the bacteria based on the uh, genetic uh, 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 constitution of the bacteria so coming to microscopy a good microscope would depend upon three property it should have a good magnification good contrast and good resolution the magnification of the microscope can be enhanced by using lens especially the concave lens if you use it will enhance the increase the magnification contrast of the microscope can be enhanced by using staining as well as if you use face contrast microscope this also increases the contrast enhances the contrast resolution is uh, nothing but it is the ability of the microscope to differentiate two points two objects as two separate points ability of the microscope to differentiate two closely placed objects as two separate objects so the resolution of the microscope they say that the uh, the resolution power of 
ह्यूमन आई इज अराउंड पॉइंट टू मिलीमीटर रेजोल्यूशन पावर ऑफ सिंपल माइक्रोस्कोप इज अराउंड पॉइंट टू माइक्रोमीटर वेर इज दैट ऑफ इलेक्ट्रॉन माइक्रोस्कोप इज अराउंड पॉइंट टू टू पॉइंट फाइव नैनोमीटर सो दिस इज हाउ द रेजोल्यूशन पावर इज देर फॉर वेरियस माइक्रोस्कोप and the resolution power is directly proportional to the refractive index of medium is directly proportional to the refractive index of medium and the refractive index of oil is greater than a that is why we use oil in oil immersion field okay the purpose of using oil in oil immersion field is to enhance the resolution because oil has a greater refractive index than air so in gen in in a nutshell lenses are used to enhance the magnification staining for enhancing the contrast oil for enhancing the resolution power of the microscope fine so these are the basic property of a microscope then coming to various microscopes light microscope is the simplest one to say that the light microscope the background will be the background will be bright and the objects appear dark in light microscope in contrast dark brown microscope the background is dark whereas object to be focused appear bright and dark brown microscope has a, has various application like it is it is used to demonstrate the thinner bacteria especially spirochetes which are extremely thin cannot be demonstrated by light microscope that can be demonstrated by dark brown microscope as well as bacterial motility and other important properties can be demonstrated by dark brown microscope living structures and they say that the living bacteria can be uh, 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 demonstrated in contrast to staining which will kill the bacteria next is phase contrast microscope phase contrast microscope what it does is it enhances the i mean it it it, it exploits the property of contrast to demonstrate the objects they say that the differences in contrast between water and bacterial cell this property is exploited to demonstrate the bacteria in the sample and so this is again a, a microscopy a method that enhances the contrast to demonstrate the bacteria and the use of phase contrast uh, microscope is again it will it, it is helpful to do, uh, demonstrate the bacteria in living stage see the contrast is also exploited by staining staining is again a method to enhance the contrast but what happens is if you stain the bacteria it will die whereas phase contrast uh, microscope demonstrate the bacteria in the living stage it is also useful for demonstrating the bacterial motility bacterial shape can be demonstrated and various in, uh, various internal structures like inclusions spores all these are demonstrated by phase contrast microscope fine then uh, coming to fluorescent microscope fluorescent microscope they say that what it does they say that any fluorescent object any fluorescent object or any object coated by fluorescent dye any object coated by fluorescent dye if you subject it to ultraviolet rays ultraviolet rays are having low wavelength low wavelength ultraviolet ray when 
it focuses on the fluorescent objects then it gets uh, converted to longer wavelength of visible rays so that you can visualize the object okay very simple uh, uh, principle when the fluorescent dye or fluorescent object is subjected to ultraviolet rays of low wavelength the low wavelength ultraviolet rays gets excited and gets uh, converted to longer wavelength visible rays and uh, that is how you are going to visualize the object and this fluorescent microscope has got various applications it has got various applications they say that first is autofluorescence if the object or if the bacteria itself is autofluorescent in nature then also can be can be seen by fluorescent uh, uh, microscope A example is cyclosporum there are various bacteria or uh, parasite which can be stained by fluorescent dye for example qbc quantitative buffy coat examination is a, is a method where we use acridine orange dye to stain malaria parasite plasmodium similarly oramin phenol staining is used Oramin is a fluorescent dye used to stain mycobacterium tuberculosis. So these organisms are not self-fluorescent in nature, but if you use a fluorescent dye to stain them, you can demonstrate the organism. But here again the problem is they are non-specific. The uh, the staining will be non-specific in nature. Hence the next application is immunofluorescent microscope, immunofluorescent assay. In this. the fluorescent dye tagged with antibody or the fluorescent dye tagged with antigen this is used to demonstrate the antibody in the sample or demonstrating the antigen in sample so this is the next application that is tagging the fluorescent dye with antibody or antigen so that it will detect the respective antigen or antibody in the sample and this will be specific in nature in contrast to just using a fluorescent dye which may be non specific okay so these are the various application of fluorescent microscope next is the most advanced microscope that is electron microscope electron microscope it is different than light microscope by various methods they say that light microscope has a magnification of 100 to 1000 whereas electron microscope has a magnification of more than 1 lakh magnification the resolution power is of light microscope is around 0.2 micron whereas electron microscope it is 0.5 nanometer okay it has a better resolution than light microscope of course the medium will be air in contrast to electron microscope where the medium is vacuumed the slide on which the object is focused the bacteria is mounted that slide is usually a glass slide for uh, light microscope where is electron microscope it will be a metal slide usually it is copper slide and the lenses also electromagnetic lens is used in contrast to concave lens used for light microscope okay so these are the various as a source of energy will be light source of energy will be light beam light source for light microscope whereas it is electron beam will be the source of energy for electron microscope okay so these are the various differences electron microscope is of two type transmission electron microscope transmission electron microscope and scanning electron microscope transmission electron microscope is i mean it is it is it is transmitted into the object so here internal structures are uh, visualized 
for a scanning electron microscope it it usually scans the surface hence the surface is uh, visualized it is it is used to demonstrate the surface of the object whereas transmission electron microscope is used to demonstrate the internal structure it gives a two dimensional view in contrast to scanning electron microscope which gives a three dimensional view okay so these are the various that uh, are differences transmission electron microscope is the most common electron uh, microscope used so i will just outline how to do the specimen preparation because specimen preparation for electron microscope is very popular is very important for your exam they say that for specimen to be prepared just like that the uh the uh, the, uh, the clinical sample you, uh, you cannot mount on the metal slide they say that you have to you have to prepare thin slices because electron microscope uh, can only be used when the thickness of the smear is very thin so to prepare this thin specimen first thing what you have to do is you have to fix fixation of the specimen is done by adding with glutarate lead followed by you have to completely dehydrate the specimen this is done by adding with various solvent like acetone or alcohol please remember complete dehydration is must for electron microscope why because the third step is you have to add the specimen you have to embed with plastic polymers the next step is the after the specimen is completely dehydrated you have to add with plastic uh, uh, polymers so that the specimen gets hardened so that the specimen gets hardened once it is hard in nature the next is you have to do slicing you have to do cutting of the specimen by by using specific knives electro tone knives uh, you can use okay so this is used to make thin slices you can cut the specimen into thin slice so that it can be mounted on the copper slate so that it can be mounted on the metal slate so this is how you have to prepare the specimen once it is prepared there are various way to uh once the smear is prepared on the slide there are various method to demonstrate you can do staining uh this is the basic one you can do negative staining also you can do shadowing shadowing means you have to stain at 45 degree angle staining is done at 45 degree angle uh, so that only a portion gets stained and the most advanced uh, version is you have uh, is called as fridge etching technique fridge etching uh, technique where you have to totally cut the surface so that the internal structures are visualized so these are the various application uh, these are the various methods to demonstrate the mounted slide by electron microscope so coming to bacterial morphology so before that just i want to summarize the differences between prokaryote and eukaryote of course this is a basic knowledge you all will have prokaryotic uh, examples are bacteria and blue green algae while eukaryotic are the parasites fungi and viruses are so primitive that they are below the characteristic of prokaryotes okay viruses the properties are so primitive that they are less than i mean they are not fitting to even the prokaryotes also they are less than the status of prokaryotes what are the differences between pro and eukaryotes prokaryotes they say that they will have cell wall composed of peptidoglycan layer whereas eukaryotes will have cell membrane 
made of sterols cholesterols are there so the only bacteria to have sterol is mycoplasma mycoplasma do not have cell wall instead of that it has sterol in the cell wall they they don't have peptidoglycan layer prokaryotes there is no cellular organ except that they have ribosome and the ribosome is 70s in nature whereas eukaryote they have all the cellular organelle including the ribosome which is 80s in nature the respiratory organelle is mesosome in prokaryote mesosome are the invagination of cell membrane of the bacteria which acts as respiratory surface whereas mitochondria are the respiratory organelle for eukaryote so these are the differences and uh, coming to the nuclear dif uh, differences there is no clear cut nucleus there is a diffuse nucleus called as nucleoid in prokaryotes prokaryote the nucleus is diffuse called as nucleoid and it it contains only one chromosome which is composed of double stranded circular dna and there is no nuclear membrane there is no nucleus uh, i mean nucleolus as well as there is no ribonucleoprotein all these are absent in prokaryotes there is no nuclear membrane there is no nucleolus there is no ribonucleoprotein so these are the basic differences between a prokaryote and eukaryote and all the bacteria are prokaryote that is parasites and fungi are eukaryotes okay so let us now discuss the various morphology of bacteria what are the different size and shape bacteria can be arranged in various shape and shape well, let us discuss based upon the gram stain and the shape of the bacteria can be gram positive cocci gram negative cocci gram positive bacilli and gram negative bacilli so gram positive cocci arranged in cluster staphylococcus arranged in chain streptococcus arranged in pair lanceolate shape pneumococcus whereas arranged in pair but spectacle it is this is enterococcus arranged in tetrad is micrococcus arranged in octet is sarsinia okay so these are the various arrangement of gram positive cocci gram negative cocci are usually arranged in pair they are always arranged in pair if it is kidney shaped gonococcus if it is lens shaped it is meningococcus meningococcus so this is the arrangement of gram negative cocci then let us discuss gram positive bacilli gram positive bacilli can be arranged in chain example is bacillus anthracis where it is called as bamboo stick appearance arrangement bamboo stick appearance arrangement it can also be arranged in chinese letter arrangement also called as cuneiform arrangement example is coryne bacterium diphtheria palisade arrangement that is other coryne bacterium species called as diphtheroids diphtheroid they have a palisade arrangement or they are parallel to each other okay gram positive bacilli can be arranged in branching pattern branching filamentous gram positive bacilli examples are actinomycetes which includes actinomyces and nocardia 
actinomyces and nocardia are under actinomyces which are arranged in branching gram positive bacilli okay so these are the various arrangement of gram positive bacilli similarly gram negative bacilli can be arranged in various way curved gram negative bacilli like campylobacter and helicobacter campylobacter has a typical gullwing appearance similarly poma shaped bacilli vibrio giving rise to fish in stream appearance fish in stream appearance poma shaped bacilli okay so then in chain gram negative bacilli in chain is streptobacillary moniliformis streptobacillary moniliformis pleomorphic pleomorphic means various size and shape pleomorphic gram negative bacilli proteus hemophilus influenza all these are pleomorphic they have different shape and size thumb print appearance body type body type arranged in thumb print appearance spirally coiled spirally coiled if they are flexible example is spirochete if the spirals are rigid spirals example is spirillum okay so these are the various size and shape of bacteria now we will discuss the bacterial morphology that is the different component of bacteria to start with bacterial cell wall bacterial cell wall what is the difference between a gram positive cell wall and a gram negative cell wall they say that the gram i mean the bacterial cell is composed of peptidoglycan the main component of bacterial cell wall is peptino peptidoglycan layer which is very thick in gram positive maybe around 100 layer thick in gram positive whereas gram negative it is the peptidoglycan layer is very thin okay are there differences like ticoic acid is a part of gram positive cell wall whereas gram negative cell wall uh, the ticoic acid is absent in place it has got lipopolysaccharide layer which is uh, which has components like lipid a which is also called as bacterial endotoxin and the somatic antigen or the o antigen o antigen or the somatic antigen so these are the component of lipopolysaccharide apart from that it also has various aromatic amino acids aromatic amino acids are absent in gram positive they are present only in gram negative so coming to the peptidoglycan layer the structure is like this peptidoglycan layer is composed of several layers in the gram positive there are almost 100 layers and each layer is composed of alternate nag and nam molecules i just write g and m nag stands for n acetyl glucose i mean nam stands for n acetyl muramic acid so like that there are 100 layers are there and from each nam molecule there is a tetrapeptide side chain from each nam molecule there is a side chain arises which is composed of four amino acids so tetrapeptide side chain so this part is common in both gram positive and gram negative the difference is in gram positive the at uh, the in in gram positive at the third position of the tetrapeptide chain the third position of the tetrapeptide chain there is l lysine compared to gram negative where the third position there is diaminopyrimidine acid 
diamino pimatic acid so the, this is one difference and the second difference is both the tetrapeptide side chain in gram positive are joined together by a pentaglycine bridge please remember both the tetrapeptide side chain in gram positive they are joined by a pentaglycine bridge and the bridge is absent in gram negative they say that both the side chains are just directly joined to each other in gram negative they say that in gram negative the bridge will be the pentaglycine bridge will be absent and both the side chains are directly joined to each other so uh, that is the difference between gram positive peptidoglycan and gram negative peptido like now we will discuss about the other component of bacterial cell <coughs> so flagella and capsule we can start with capsule capsule is the glycocalyx substances released outside and if it is they say that it is extracellular extracellular glycocalyx like substances released by the bacteria and it forms a layer outside the bacterial cell wall if it is uh, well organized it is called as capsule if it is loosely formed it is called as slimelet loosely formed it is called as slimelet and the main function of the capsule is it prevents the bacteria from phagocytosis it prevents the bacteria from phagocytosis this is the main function of the capsule apart from that it also helps in addition and they say that at times bacteria can form biofilm because of the capsule so they say that uh, this is the bacterial cell and if the capsule is well organized it is called as capsule if it is loosely formed it is called as slimelet and biofilm is nothing but the capsule of adjacent bacteria they merge to each other they say that this bi this biofilm is usually found on plastic surface so whenever any device is there inside the body like uh, for example uh, catheters ventilator tubes central lines or even even the stitches sutures iv sunts so any uh, devices if they are there in say, any plastic devices are there in the body bacteria tend to form biofilm on the plastic surface and the biofilm is is nothing but it is the coalescence of the adjacent bacterial capsules millions of bacteria the capsules get merged to each other and the bacteria will be embedded inside bacteria will be embedded inside and this kind of biofilm helps in adhesion to the plastic surface it helps in adhesion and invasion to the plastic surface first uh, property and also it prevents the antibiotic entry it also prevents the antibiotic entry the antibiotics are not allowed to enter inside and that leads to bacterial resistance so it is it is a, a one of the method of bacterial drug resistance okay so biofilm is another important function of capsule okay there are various examples of capsulated bacteria the capsulated organisms example mostly the capsule is composed of polysaccharide most of the capsules are composed of polysaccharide example is pneumococcus meningococcus h influenza vi polysaccharide capsule of salmonella typhi all these are polysaccharide capsules clebsiella pneumoniae again one more example sometimes pseudomonas also not always but some strains of uh, pseudomonas Whereas capsule is polypeptide in nature. Here the one and only example is Bacillus anthracis. Bacillus anthracis, the capsule is polypeptide in nature. Capsule can be hyaluronic acid. It is composed of 
hyaluronic acid capsule is present in streptococcus pyogenes. Streptococcus pyogenes, the capsule is composed of hyaluronic acid. And the only fungi to be capsulated is Cryptococcus neoformans. Cryptococcus neoformans also has a polysaccharide capsule. It is the only fungus to be capsulated. How to demonstrate the capsule? You can demonstrate the capsule by various means. Like, for example, you can do quelling reaction. Quelling reaction is done in to demonstrate a pneumococcal capsule. Pneumococcal capsule is demonstrated by Coulomb reaction. Mac Ferdinand reaction. This is done to demonstrate anthrax capsule by adding a stain called as polychrome methylene glue stain. Polychrome methylene glue stain. In the iron stain, the most popular method to demonstrate the capsule is by negative stain example is India stain where the capsule will stand out and the background will be black it's an example of negative stain and of course latex agglutination test latex agglutination test can also be done by using the anti-capsular antibody coated with latex uh, particles this is the best method to demonstrate the capsule this is the best and the most confirmatory method to demonstrate the capsule. Okay, so these are various ways for demonstration of capsule. Next, we will discuss flagella. Flagella is the organ of locomotion. It helps in bacterial motility. Flagella are around 5 to 20 micron in length. And it has got three parts. It has got a base. and a hook and a filament so like that it has got three parts it has a base by which it is attached to the bacterial cell wall and a hook through which the filament arises ok so it has got three basic uh, component and it is the organ of locomotion it is also antigenic in nature and antiflagellar antibodies are protective I mean, they are used for diagnostic. Antiflagellar antibodies are sometimes they are uh, protective, not always. But please remember, they are of topmost diagnostic importance. They are used for diagnostic, like uh, for, uh, for example, H antibodies are detected in case of uh, uh, enteric fever by the by the Vidal test. Okay, so they are of diagnostic importance. There are various arrangement of flagella. Like for example, peritricus flagella. That is, flagella arises all over the body. Example is E. coli, salmonella, etc. Peritricus flagella. That is, flagella arises all over the body. Polar flagella. Polar or monotricus flagella. That is, flagella arises only from one pole. Single flagella at one pole, example is Vibrio pseudomonas, monotricus or polar, uh, polar flagella. Then amphitricus flagella and lophotricus flagella. Amphitricus and lophotricus flagella. Lophotricus flagella is tougher flagella at one pole. Amphitricus flagella is flagella may be there at both the pole. Either, either single or tough of flagella at both the pole. Lophotricus flagella spirillum. Amphitricus flagella, the example is alkaligenous. Alkaligenous. Okay, so like that there are various arrangements of flagella. Next is what are the various types of motility? As I told you, flagella is the mean of motility of the bacteria. So, what are the various bacterial motility that can be asked in the exam? Yes, tumbling motility is seen in Listeria. 
tumbling motility is seen in Listeria. Tarting motility is seen in Vibrio. Apart from that, Campylobacter. Sometimes Aeromonas can also have darting motility, but the most important example is Vibrio. Okay, stately motility is seen in Prostidium. Swarming is a specialized motility seen by Proteus. Apart from that, Clostridium titani and Vibrio parahemolitis. Okay, so these are the various uh, motility. Then, uh, lasting motility, cork, screw motility, all these are seen by spirochetes. And please remember, spirochete is the only example where you will have endoflagell. That is flagella present inside the cell wall. Endoflagella. Okay. So let us now discuss the other important areas. That is how to demonstrate the flagella. Flagella can be demonstrated by various methods. Flagella can be demonstrated by various methods. First is by using staining technique like tannic acid stain. Apart from that, various microscopic methods in electron microscope, phase contrast microscope, diagram microscope, all that can be done to demonstrate the flagella. Otherwise, so, th so these are the direct method to demonstrate the flagella. Indirectly you can demonstrate the flagella by demonstrating the motility. If the bacteria is motile, it is indirect mean to say that the flagella are present. There are various ways to demonstrate the motility. The best method is Craig's tube method. Craig's tube method. Most commonly done uh, method is hanging rod. Apart from that, other methods like various semi-solid media can be used. For example, manitol motility medium. Manitol motility medium is an example of semi-solid medium as there are various other semi-solid semi media also can be used to demonstrate the motility. We will also uh, uh, detect the flagellin which is the gene responsible to code for flagella that also can be demonstrated by detecting PCR okay so these are the various mean of detecting the flagella next is fimbria or pilus pilus is singular pili is plural they are hair like appendages much smaller to flagella around 0.5 micro uh, meter in length much smaller to flagella and they are organ of adhesion they help in adhesion they say that if the flagella will be like this then fimbria will be like this they are much smaller to flagella hair like appendages and their main function is to help in adhesion apart from that rarely there is a Flagella called as, uh, there is a fimbria called as sex fimbria or sex pilus. This helps in formation of conjugation tube that is responsible for bacterial gene transfer by conjugation. Okay? So, this is the sex fimbria or sex pilus. How to detect the fimbria? You can detect the fimbria by electron microscope. Other than that, very indirect mean is that like fibria can form surface pellicle. On the surface of the liquid medium, the fibria can form surface pellicle. Fibria can agglutinate with RBC. So heme agglutination reaction can be done to, to detect the fibria because fibria has a property to get agglutinated to the various surface receptors of RBC. Okay, so these are the various methods to detect the fimbria. Fine. Now there are various inclusions. 
So there are various inclusions or the storage granules produced by the organism. Inclusions are nothing but they are the storage granules produced by the bacteria, which can be classified as organic granules and inorganic granules. Inorganic granules, the example is volutin granule or metachromatic granules in, in coagulant bacterium dipteri. Volutin or metachromatic granules seen in coagulant bacterium dipteri. Various organic granules like starch, glycogen, lipid granules, all these are examples of various organic granules. Right? There is something about L form. L stands for Lister Institute London and this is the cell wall deficient form of the organism discovered by the scientist Klein Berger in Lister Institute London. It is a cell wall deficient form of the organism. They say that irrespective of the original size and shape, if you remove the cell wall, it becomes spherical in, in nature. The bacteria becomes spherical in nature if you, if you remove the cell wall. And if you remove the cell wall, the bacteria becomes spherical. And as the cell wall is not there, the bacteria will be resistant to the various cell wall acting antibiotic. So please remember it is a mean of showing bacterial drug resistance because L form is a form where the cell wall acting antibiotic will not work. From gram positive organism, if you remove the cell wall, the L form is called as protoplast. Whereas the L form of gram negative bacteria, if you remove the cell wall, the L form what is formed is called as spiroplast. Okay, so protoplast and spiroplast are the L form of gram positive and gram negative bacteria. In presence of antibiotic pressure, usually the bacteria they lose the cell wall to form L form. But on removal of antibiotic, they revert back to the original size. This is called as unstable L form. Uh, this is called as unstable L form and uh, this is the most common form of L form because most of the bacteria they lose cell wall in presence of antibiotic pressure and when the antibiotic is removed again they will revert back to the original cell. So this is called as unstable L form. If the bacteria remain the cell wall deficient form for constantly it is called as stable L form. And mycoplasma may represent stable L form of bacteria but it is not confirmed yet. It is a controversial matter because uh, many authors they support, uh, many authors they oppose to say that mycoplasma is a stable L form because the uh, opposition is, uh, it, it is because uh, mycoplasma the cell wall is absent from the beginning. In contrast to the definition of L, wall, L form, uh, L form is uh, defined as the normally appearing uh, uh, bacteria when they lose their cell wall they transform into L form. In contrast uh, mycoplasma they have I mean they are in a cell wall deficient form right from the beginning. Hence it is a controversial issue to say that it is L form or not. So this is all about various structure of bacteria. Now we will discuss about the physiology of bacteria. What is generation time? Generation time is the so coming to the physiology of bacteria, what is generation time? Generation time is the population multiplication time. It is the it is the minimum time for the bacteria to divide and multiply into double the number. So the generation time of most of the bacteria is around 20 minutes. E. coli and most of the other bacteria, the generation time is around 20 minutes. In contrast, Mycobacterium tuberculosis and Mycobacterium lepra, the generation time is around 15 hours and around 15 to 20 days. So this is the difference. 20 minutes, 20 hours and 20 days like that you can remember. The generation time of E. coli is the shortest. 
कम टू बैक्टीरियल ग्रोथ कब बैक्टीरियल ग्रोथ कर्व इज अ कर्व विच डिटर्मिन्स द वायबल एंड द टोटल काउंट ऑफ द बैक्टीरिया वेन इट इज ग्रोन इन लिक्विड मीड सो वेन वेन बैक्टीरिया वेन बैक्टीरिया ग्रो इन ए लिक्विड मीडियम द ग्रोथ अकर्स अंडर फोर डिफरेंट फेजेस द फर्स्ट फेज when you inoculate bacteria into a medium first phase is called as lag phase where the bacteria doesn't multiply i'll tell you the differences first there is a lag phase then there is a log phase or exponential phase then there is a stationary phase then there is a decline phase okay lag phase the bacteria doesn't divide neither it dies it is a phase where the bacteria forms the metabolic enzymes so that it will divide in the next phase it will uh, it will prepare its machinery the metabolites enzymes and all so that in the next phase it will start dividing as a result the bacteria gradually increase in size and the bacteria attains its maximum size at the end of the lag phase this is mcq what the frequently asked at the end of the lag phase the bacteria attains its maximum size next is the log phase log phase is a phase where log phase is a phase where the bacteria divides exponentially the bacteria divides exponentially however it is smaller in size it is the most active phase of the of the bacterial growth curve and this is the best phase for demonstrating the gram stain because the bacteria will be uniformly stained and also it is biochemically active in log phase so please remember log phase is a phase where we have to do the staining method or the biochemical reaction because it is the most active stage where it is uniformly stained and it is biochemically active followed by there is a stationary phase and in this phase the bacteria divides as well as the bacteria start dying hence the total number is constant and in this phase you uh, bacteria form various structures like storage granules are formed in stationary phase sporulation occurs in, in stationary phase bacteria forms bacteriocin and there are certain uh, bacteria that can produce antibiotics also penicillin and vancomycin there are various antibiotics uh, uh, can be produced by bacteria and all those antibiotics are produced in stationary phase and after some time the bacteria enters into the enters into the decline phase of growth curve where it doesn't divide it only dies hence the hence the number falls down hence the number falls down the viable number falls down okay and in this phase in the in the, in the decline phase involution forms are some are seen involution forms are seen in stationary phase in uh, in uh, in decline phase involution forms are nothing but they are the aberrant or the irregular form of bacteria which are formed just before the death of the bacteria and usually it in the decline phase of growth curve and gonococcus and yersinia pestis are the example where the involution forms are more common gonococcus and yersinia pestis so this is all about bacterial growth curve that i tell you about the various factors which is responsible for physiology of bacteria factors responsible for bacterial uh, physiology or let us discuss about the oxygen requirement based upon the oxygen requirement you can classify the bacteria into obligate aerobe obligate anaerobe then microaerophilic 
period of tolerant facultative anaerobic facultative aerobic like that there are six uh, category obligate aerobic oxygen is lethal bacteria cannot grow on in presence of oxygen various examples are there like pseudomonas mycobacterium tuberculosis brucella then bacillus anthracis nocardia all these are example of obligate aerobic where oxygen is lethal obligate sorry it grows in presence of oxygen it grows in presence of oxygen oxygen is must in contrast obligate anaerobic where oxygen is lethal oxygen is lethal and here bacteria cannot grow in presence of oxygen here the example is clostridium in contrast aerobic tolerant anaerobic are the anaerobic which can grow in presence of oxygen but it does not utilize the oxygen it will grow in presence of oxygen for some time but it doesn't utilize the oxygen and here the example is clostridium histolytica clostridium histolytica micro aerophilic they require 5 to 10% of oxygen example is helicobacter and campylobacter as well as mycobacterium bovis these are example of micro aerophilic organism which require 5 to 10% of oxygen facultative anaerobic and aerobic facultative anaerobic is a aerobic which can also grow anaerobically and most of the pathogenic organism like e coli enterobacteriaceae other organisms staphylococcus streptococcus most of the pathogenic organisms are facultative anaerobic which are actually aerobic but which can also grow anaerobically in contrast facultative aerobes are anaerobic which can also grow aerobically example is lactobacilli lactobacilli are anaerobes which can also grow aerobically they are example of facultative aerobes so these are the various organisms classified based upon their oxygen requirement okay so this is all about oxygen requirement apart from that there are other factors that can affect the physiology of bacteria like our uh, carbon dioxide those organisms are called as capnophilic organism like pneumococcus h influenza and all then the temperature requirement uh, based upon which you can classify the organism into cyclophilic mesophilic and thermophilic okay most of the pathogenic organisms are mesophilic which can grow in in and around body temperature okay so these are the various factors required for physiology of bacteria now we will discuss about bacterial pathogenesis in which first we will discuss about infective dose infective dose is the minimum dose required for uh, uh, causing the disease a minimum load of the organism required for disease manifestation the infective dose is usually low for sigella and enteroinvasive e coli and enterohemorrhagic e coli antimoiva histolytica giardia all these the infective the infective dose is low in contrast there is high infective dose required for salmonella and vibrio they say that uh, sigella the infective dose is uh, 10 to 100 organism around uh, 10 organism for sigella 10 to 3 to 6 organism is infective dose for salmonella whereas for vibrio it is 10 to 6 to 8 the high infective dose of vibrio can be explained because of the reason that it is acid labile and it has to bypass the gastric barrier to uh, 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 reach the intestine now a bit about bacterial toxins Bacterial toxins can be classified as endotoxin and exotoxin. 
Endotoxin are lipopolysaccharide in nature in contrast to exotoxin which are proteinaceous in nature. Ectotoxins are secreted outside. Whereas endotoxin is a part of bacterial cell wall. Okay? Exotoxins are heat labile. They are highly antigenic. They can be toxoided. And they have specific action. Enzymatic. They are enzymatic in nature, and each 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 endotoxin has specific action. In contrast, endotoxin of all the bacteria they are similar in function. Endotoxin of each and every endotoxin has a specific enzymatic action. Whereas in general, all LPS or all endotoxins they are similar in function. They are heat stable. They are less antigenic. Okay, so these are the differences. Now I will tell you the various and exotoxins and their mechanism of action. The exotoxins can be classified based upon their mechanism of action, such as inhibition of protein synthesis. Protein synthesis can be inhibited by two methods. By inhibiting the elongation factor 2, this is seen by diphtheria toxin and pseudomonas exotoxin A. Protein synthesis can also be inhibited by inhibiting ribosome. This is seen by virocytotoxin and cigatoxin. Virocytotoxin is produced by enterohemorrhagic E. coli and cigatoxin. Inhibiting the ribosome. Toxin that activates cyclic AMP. This is examples are cholera toxin, heat labile toxin of E. coli, anthrax edema factor, and pertussis toxin. Pertussis toxin. All these are the toxins that activate cyclic AMP. Toxin that activates that activate cyclic GMP is heat stable toxin of E. coli. Heat stable toxin of E. coli. Then toxin that act on nervous system, neurotoxins. Neurotoxins examples are botulinum toxin and tetanus toxin. Boss, botulinum toxin, they say that. For muscle contraction, you have a positive stimulus provided by acetylcholine. You have a negative stimulus for muscle contraction provided by glycine and GABA. Glycine and GABA. Botulinum toxin inhibits the release of ACH. Botulinum toxin inhibits the release of ACH. That leads to flaccid contraction of the muscle. In contrast, tetanus toxin inhibits the negative stimulator that is glycine and GABA that leads to spastic muscle uh, contraction. So these are the two important examples of neurotoxin. Then toxin that act as super antigen. That is, they activate T cells polyclonal. Polyclonal activation of T cells by binding to variable beta receptor of T cell receptor. They activate T cells uh, polyclonally by binding to variable beta receptor of T cell uh, uh, receptor. Such toxins are staphylococcal toxin like staphylococcal enterotoxin, toxic shock syndrome toxin and streptococcal toxin that is streptococcus pyrogenic endotoxin A, B and C. So these are the example of toxins that act as super antigen. Fine? Good morning. So coming to sterilization, this is the most important chapter in general microbiology. So coming to the definitions, <coughs> sterilization is defined as killing of all microorganisms, all microorganisms including spores 
and there should be a reduction of 10 to 6 log colony forming unit of organisms at least this much organism reduction should take place in contrast disinfection is defined as killing of all microorganisms excluding spores and here the reduction of organism will be around 10 to 3 log colony forming unit of organism so these are the two distinctions what you have to remember other important entities will be asepsis which will be uh, killing of the pathogenic organism on the surface of the body skin or mucosal surface of the body this is called as asepsis decontamination is killing of organism up to or removal of organism from the floor or maybe equipments so that they are safe to handle so that they are safe to handle ok so these are the four uh, different entities you should be remembering so coming to the classification the various methods that is employed for bringing out sterilization and disinfection so methods can be classified as physical method and a chemical method physical method it could be heat sterilizer which could be either moist heat or dry heat it could be filtration it could be radiation ok so these are the various methods under physical methods Heat sterilization, they usually ask the mechanism of killing of organism. They say that moist heat kills by protein denaturation. Protein coagulation. Whereas dry heat, the mechanism of destruction is the code is code itself which stands for charring operated demise and elevated electrolyte so this is the mechanism of killing of dry heat so coming to the various methods under dry heat and moist heat dry heat there are various uh, methods are there. The, mo the most important is hot air over. Apart from that, other methods of dry heat like incineration and other less capable methods, less efficient uh, uh, methods like sun rays blaming, drying, all these are other less capable methods. So hot air over is the most important method on the dry heat. Here the MCQ what they ask mostly uh, uh, confined to what are the material that can be sterilized under hot air over. So most of the materials which are destroyed by moist heat which are destroyed by moist heat, they are subjected to sterilization by dry heat. For example, all the glass item, all the glass item like glass flasks, glass slides, glass syringes, so glass bottles. So glass items are destroyed by, um, by autoclip, that is by moist heat. Hence they are sterilized by hot air over. Apart from that liquid paraffin, 
then oil grease glycerol all these are various other methods that can be sterilized by hot air oven second mcq what they ask uh, what is the indicator the biological indicator of sterilization is for hot air oven we use clostridium chitin the spores of clostridium chitin is used as biological indicator for sterilization what is the temperature to be maintained hot air oven 160 degree centigrade for 2 hours this is the temperature to be maintained for hot air oven Coming to various methods of moist heat. Moist heat, it could be less than hundred degrees centigrade, more than hundred degrees centigrade, and at hundred degrees centigrade. Okay. So less than hundred degrees centigrade, the various uh, methods are first is pasteurized. Pasteurization is usually done for milk. There are two methods: Holden's method and Flask method. Holden methods provides a temperature of 63 degree centigrade for 20 minutes, whereas Flask method 72 degree centigrade for 15 to 20 seconds. Okay, and please remember. it is not especially the holden method is not useful not effective for coxella burnet coxella burnet so this is one method of uh, uh, moist it less than 100 degrees centigrade apart from that other methods like water bath or vaccin bath which is usually applicable for disinfection of vaccines this is used for 1 hour 60 degree centigrade for 1 hour vaccine bath there are more method is called as inspissation inspissation is less than 100 degree that is approximately 80 degree uh, centigrade for 20 minute for Three consecutive days. So this is the temperature to maintain 80 degree centigrade for for 20 minutes for three consecutive days. This is useful for egg and serum containing medium which which will be destroyed by higher temperature. So egg containing medium like alzheimer medium, dorsal egg medium, serum containing medium like low flow serum soap. So these are the media that should be. disinfected by inspissation so coming to the methods of moist heat at 100 degrees centigrade at 100 degrees centigrade it could be boiling steaming and third is tindalization Tindalization is uh, nothing but it is 100 degree centigrade. Applying 100 degree uh, centigrade for 20 minute for three consecutive days. It is almost same like inspissation. Only thing is the temperature is different. It is 100 degree centigrade for 20 minute for three consecutive days. This is also useful for gelatin and serum containing medium. Gelatin and serum or sugar containing media they are sterilized by uh, tindalize they are sterilized by tindalize fine so this is all about at 100 degree then above 100 degree uh, centigrade the one and only example is autoclave this is one of the excellent method of sterilization And here the temperature to maintain is 121 degree centigrade for 15 minute at 15 psi pressure. So this is the most recommended temperature for autoclave. 121 for 15 minute for 15 psi pressure. And 
this is uses uh, this is useful autoclave is used for sterilization of most of the microbiological culture media which can withstand higher temperature which can withstand higher temperature biological control of sterilization for autoclave is bacillus Bacillus stearothermophilus. This is the biological control for autoclave. Okay, so this is all about the heat sterilizing. Coming to filtration. Filtration is useful. The indication of Filtration is it is ex, it is usually done for heat level substances. All sort of heat level uh, substances like serum, sugar, toxin, antibiotic, vaccine, as well as to to to, to separate the viruses from bacteria. to separate the viruses from bacteria. So the, all these are the indication of filtration. There are two filtration uh, methods are available broadly uh, categorized into duct filters and membrane filters. Duct uh, uh, filters are those filters though those with uh, they will Remove the particles throughout the depth of the filters. Okay, so when a liquid media is uh, is allowed to cross through a depth filter, the microorganisms are held back throughout the depth of the filter. In contrast, membrane filter are those that will restrict the microorganism only at the surface not throughout the depth of the membrane. Depth filters are usually they are used in industrial application. They have mostly industrial application. And various examples are there like candle filters, seeds filter. All these are previously used filters and mainly they were used for industrial application. In contrast, membrane filters are the most recommended uh, 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 filters for bacterial filters. And there are and uh, usually they are, they are composed of various membranes like cellulose membrane, polyvinyl membrane, all these are the various type of membrane which are available. And the average pore diameter is around 0.22 micrometer for the membranes. And there are two variations in the membrane of, of filters. Uh, there are two variety, uh, special type of membrane filters. Those are examples are HEPA filter and ALPA filter. HEPA filter is high efficiency particulate air filter high efficiency particulate air filter it can remove 99.97 percent of organism having a diameter of more than 0.3 micrometer whereas alpha filter is ultra low particulate air filter and it has a capability of removing almost 99.99% of organism having a diameter of uh, less than and uh, more than 0 0.12 micrometer having a diameter having a diameter of 0 0.12 micrometer okay so this is the uh, cutoff for HEPA filters and this is the cutoff for alpha filters. So these HEPA and alpha filters 
are usually they are applied for the filtration of air okay for air filtration hepa and alpha filters are used okay uh, uh, one second hepa stands for high efficiency of particulate air alpha stands for ultra low of particulate air filtration okay so this is all about filtration then we can discuss about radiation radiation are two types ionizing radiation and non ionizing radiation non ionizing radiation are examples are ultraviolet ray and infrared rays the uv rays they are used for the disinfection of operation theaters ward etc or or any open space disinfection okay they have low penetrating power and they are usually used for disinfection of operation theater ward and open space as well as the disinfection of laminar wood where the microbiological work will be going on for that disinfection also ultraviolet rays are used infrared ray uh, i mean the ionizing radiations examples are cobalt rays x ray cosmic rays etc gamma rays uh, uh, cobalt rays the example is it is an example of gamma rays so all these are example of ionizing radiation and they the the mechanism is they break the dna without raise of any temperature there is no temperature raise in ionizing radiation hence it is also called as cold sterilization it is also called as cold sterilization because there is no temperature raise hence it is the ideal method for sterilization of heat labile substances like candied sutures plastic syringes or any other uh, plastic um, uh, material adhesives adhesive dressing material plastic adhesive dressing material all these which are heat labile those can be sterilized by ionizing uh, radiation so coming to the chemical methods or the disinfectants disinfectants can be classified based upon the mechanism of action into low level low level disinfectant intermediate level disinfectant high level disinfectant and chemical sterilant so this classification is based on which organisms they are going to kill the low level disinfectant they can kill uh before i describe this i can i can uh, 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 tell you the decreasing order of microorganism based upon their resistance to be killed by disinfectants highest uh, resistant organisms are i mean structures are prions followed by cryptosporidium oocyst followed by the other oocyst other coccidian oocyst other coccidian parasite oocyst then you have bacterial spores bacterial spores followed by you have mycobacterium tuberculosis then you have fungi then unenveloped viruses then ordinary bacteria and ordinary enveloped viruses ordinary bacteria also gram negative are more resistant than gram positive okay so this is the order prions are the highest resistant structures followed by cryptosporidium oocyst 
other coccidinosis, then bacterial spores, then mycobacterium tuberculosis, fungi, un unenveloped viruses, then bacteria, then gram negative, more than gram positive, then followed by enveloped viruses. So the low level disinfectants, they, they are capable of killing the ordinary viruses and bacteria. However, they cannot kill other such as fungi will be plus minus. And uh, mycobacterium spores or, and all the other structures they are not able to kill. Intermediate level uh, disinfectants they can kill all like low level, low level plus they can also kill mycobacterium tuberculosis. Okay. High level disinfectants they can also kill spores. And chemical stain, they can also kill the other structures like the uh, uh, cryptosporidium oocyst and prions. Prions are uh, considered as highest level disinfectant. Prions are considered as highest level disinfectant and highest uh, resistant to disinfectant, and they can be killed by various extreme of uh, mechanisms like for example autoclaving for 134 degrees centigrade for one hour or maybe applying sodium hydroxide for one to two hours or maybe sodium hypochlorite for again one to two hours so these are the various extreme of mechanisms to denaturate destroy the prions so coming to some of the disinfectants and their important role, I can summarize what are the sporicidal agents. There are various disinfectants which can kill the spores and the sporicidal agents can, the examples are, abbreviation is the EFGH, stands for ethylene oxide. Formaldehyde, glutaraldehyde, and hypochlorite hydrogen peroxide. Hypochlorite will be plus minus, but hydrogen peroxide will, all, will always kill the spores. Apart from that, 3P stands for paracetic acid, then orthopthaldehyde, orthopthaldehyde. which is commonly abbreviated as OPA and plasma sterilization plasma sterilization apart from that of course the physical methods like autoclave and hot air oven also can kill the spores so these are the various methods that can destroy the spores Okay, so some of the disinfectants we can discuss now. We can summarize the important features coming to alcohols. Alcohols, especially ethyl alcohol, they are used for hand hygiene purposes. Mainly they are used in hand rub and hand wash. Surgical spirit also contains ethyl alcohol. Isopropyl alcohol, the CDC recommends to use isopropyl alcohol for clinical thermometer disinfection. Disinfection of thermometer. Then formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is used for fumigation of operation uh, theater and other closed spaces. Apart from that, it is also used for preservation of anatomical specimen. Preservation of organs and anatomical specimens. However, it has it is corrosive and it has a very pungent order. All these are drawback of of formaldehyde, but please remember it is an excellent disinfectant, it is policidal and it is one of the chemical sterilant. 
which can destroy almost all the structures so because it is uh, uh, because it is corrosive to the metal hence formaldehyde is not recommended for the various sensitive metals like endoscopes so for this purpose the best method is glutaraldehyde glutaraldehyde is equally efficacious like formaldehyde but it is less corrosive hence it is best for endoscopes the various endoscopes cystoscopes bronchoscopes uh, laryngoscopes all these are best all these are better they are uh, sterilized by the glutaraldehyde glutaraldehyde the usual concentration is 2% but however now cdc recommends to use 2.4% glutaraldehyde and uh, the most uh, commercial uh, famous brand is cytex glutaraldehyde has a drop like that it needs to be activated on on opening of the bottle the first time you have to activate the glutaraldehyde by alkalization and once it is activated the glutaraldehyde will remain activated and once it is activated it has to be used within 14 days otherwise the efficacy will be destroyed hence the i mean uh, this is uh, one of the important drawback of uh, glutaraldehyde so to combat that orthoptaldehyde is in use now this is again more popular than glutaraldehyde nowadays many hospitals they use opa instead of uh, glutaraldehyde for the same purpose uh, that is the disinfection of endoscopes it is a better uh, acceptable uh, disinfectant than uh, glutaraldehyde and 0.55% a uh, concentration is mostly used okay and it is uh, the advantage of orthoptaldehyde is it is the activation is uh, not required the alkylation uh, leading to its activation is there what is there for glutaraldehyde that step is not there for orthoptaldehyde something about plasma sterilization this is this is something they ask plasma sterilization there are three to four important components which you need to remember this is again a process which will achieve chemical sterilization i mean it is an example of chemical sterilization it can kill all the uh, vegetative structures including the spores and here hydrogen peroxide is used as a disinfectant and the medium need to be vacuum okay and they say that plasma sterilization again the control of sterilization is bacillus spirothermophilus bacillus spirothermophilus and another point to remember is here here also the low temperature is augmenting hence again heat loving substances which uh, cannot be sterilized by autoclave those can be put into plasma sterilization Only drawback is it is quite expensive, hence it is not available in uh, most of the places. Okay, but this is again an upcoming sterilization uh, method which is frequently asked. Something about ethylene oxide. Ethylene oxide is also sporicidal. Yes. this is used mainly it is used for sterilization of ventilated circuits yes heart lung machine dental equipments okay all these are various uh, struct a uh, uh, parts which can be sterilized by ethylene oxide here also low temperature is been maintained around 55 degree uh, centigrade for 4 hours and ethylene oxide again they say that it is carcinogenic the drawback is it is carcinogenic as well as it is explosive okay hence it is always mixed with hydrogen and 
helium and other inert gases to make it less explosive uh, less ex explosive so next we will discuss about the spalding classification Spalding has classified the various equipments and instruments in the hospital into various uh, divisions like it has classified the equipments into critical devices, semi-critical devices and non-critical devices. Critical devices are those devices that will come in contact with the sterile environment. That will come in uh, contact with the sterile environment of the body. So those examples are all the surgical items, all the surgical instruments, cardiac instruments, etc. And for the sterilization of critical device, always a chemical sterilant or a high level disinfectant is used. Semi-critical devices are those that comes in contact with mucous membrane. And here the they say that here, I mean, examples of this will be the endoscopes, cystoscopes, laryngoscopes, etc. And here, again, a high level disinfectant is again used for sterilization. Whereas, non critical devices are those devices that will come in contact with intact skin, such as your uh, stethoscopes, BP apparatus etc. and here may be a low level disinfectant will be enough ok so this is folding classification which is again in the hospital we use this classification to uh, 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 to implement which disinfectant to use for which purpose ok so this is again important for you then something about disinfectant testing There are three important uh, methods of disinfectant uh, testing. The most oldest and uh, uh, popular method is uh, phenolic coefficient or needle walker test. This uh, method they say that. It uh, tests the efficacy of a disinfection. Usually, it tests the efficacy of a phenolic group of disinfection by comparing the efficacy of phenol to star polys, uh, to salmonella type. Here, here salmonella type is used as organism against which the disinfectant is tested. Like there are various phenolic group of uh, disinfectants that are there like phenol, crisol, lysol, etc. So the phenolic, any phenolic group of disinfectant, the efficacy against salmonella type is uh, tested by comparing that of phenol to salmonella type. So if the phenolic coefficient is more than one, the disinfectant is said to be satisfactory. Here the drawback of uh, the Redo Walker test is first is it can test only the phenolic group of a disinfectant because you are using phenol as standard so you cannot compare with other class of disinfectant. Second uh, drawback is it doesn't test the efficacy of the disinfectant in presence of organic matter. So in presence of organic matter the disinfectant is working properly or not that is then why it is called as Chick Martin test. This test checks the efficacy of 
of disinfectant to retain its efficacy in presence of organic matter there is organic matter are there like for example stool blood pus is all these are various organic matter in presence of the organic matter whether the disinfectant is able to retain its efficacy that is tested by chick martin test the third test is the capacity test or calcicide test here the disinfectant i mean you are going to check the efficacy of the disinfectant you are going to check the efficacy of the disinfectant or the capacity of the uh, disinfection capacity of the disinfectant to retain its efficacy when the microbiological load keeps increasing keeps increasing like uh, like for example uh, what, what you do is you, you you take a big beaker with maybe a 100 ml of a, a particular disinfectant then you keep on increasing the microbiological load uh, keep on increasing the organic i mean the organism load and this test checks the capacity of the disinfectant to retain its microbiologic uh, microbiological efficacy when the organism organism load keeps increasing so this is called as capacity test or calcicide test and of course the last or not the least is in use test that is this test checks the efficacy of the disinfection in real time real time uh, that is in the real time uh, situation of the hospital whether this disinfectant is able to Uh, uh produce the same efficacy or not that is uh, tested by in use test okay so these are the various method of disinfectant testing so coming to the third chapter culture media uh, what are the basic ingredients of a culture media the basic ingredients of a uh, culture media will be peptone water salt and of course agar and meat extract meat extract agar is used as a solidifying agent it is used as a solidifying agent and please remember it doesn't have nutritive value there is no nutritive value for agar it uh, it doesn't provide nutrition to the medium it is only used as a solidifying agent so what are the various basic media example basic media or simple media examples are peptone water broth nutrient broth and nutrient agar peptone water broth has got peptone salt and water nutrient broth is uh, nothing but peptone water broth plus meat extract and nutrient agar is nutrient broth plus agar so it is a solid medium where is peptone water broth and nutrient broth are the liquid medium and the role of the basal media basal media they help in demonstrating the non fastidious nature of organism so to demonstrate that the organism is fastidious or not you have to use a basal medium because if it is growing on a uh, uh, basal medium it is said to be non fastidious also used to demonstrate the bacterial pigment and also the various biochemical reactions can be performed on basal media in a much better way they say that basal media is the best method a uh, best media to demonstrate the catalyst stage oxidation stage and various other biochemical reactions so other type of media next is enriched media enriched media is basal media 
if you add various enriched substances like blood serum egg then it then it becomes enriched in it so that it can support the fastidious organism also enriched medium the fastidious organism also can be supported examples are blood agar chocolate agar loafless serums loaf etc okay chocolate agar is a nothing but heated blood agar it support hemophilus influenza which is a highly fastidious organism okay next is enrichment broth and selectivity both the basic definition is same enrichment broth and selective medium the common definition is they support the pathogenic organism in the sample there is that means they inhibit the normal flora present in the sample they inhibit the normal flora in the sample whereas they support the pathogenic organism in the sample because there is extra inhibitory substance which is added so enrichment broth and a selective medium here you add an extra inhibitory substance so that it will inhibit the other organisms and only support the pathogen or the wanted organism present in the clinical sample so this is a common definition the the difference is enrichment broth is a liquid medium and a selective medium is a, is a solid medium otherwise the definition is same example of enrichment broth alkaline krypton water broth for vibrio alkaline krypton water broth mansoor's broth this is also for vibrio okay similarly selenite f broth gram negative broth and tetrathionate broth selenite f broth gram negative broth and tetrathionate broth all these three are used for salmonella and sigal for salmonella and sigal okay example of selective medium are plenty selective medium examples are plenty tcbs and the mansoor's medium all these are for vibrio then uh, l the low the loenstein jensen medium for manufacturing tuberculosis wilson blair medium for salmonella dca deoxycholate citrate agar xld all this for sigella and samla okay so there are the various selective medium there are so many other media also you, you can have a look it is given in detail in your book okay transport media it is used for transportation of the of the sample from the from the site of collection to the microbiology lab and please remember bacteria do not multiply in transport way it is only used for transportation of the specimen but bacteria usually do not multiply in transport medium examples are pipes medium for streptococcus okay stewards medium and amis medium for gonococcus vector ramon ramakrishnan medium carry blair medium this is for vibrio okay so like that there are various transport medium which can be asked in the exam fine next is differential medium differential medium are the media which can differentiate the bacteria into two groups based upon some specific property example is mekong ke agar mekong ke agar based on lactose fermentation it divides or it can differentiate the bacteria into lactose fermenting bacteria which will produce pink colony and non lactose fermenting bacteria which will produce colorless or pale colony even clade agar that is cysteine lactose electrolyte deficient agar 
is also an example of differential medium which has the same property that is it can differentiate the gram uh, negative bacteria into lactose uh, fermenters and non lactose uh, fermenters it is it is specifically used for culture of urine specimens the the advantage of clay agar over mekongke agar is it can also support the gram positive and yeast whereas mekong ke agar may not support gram positive and yeast whereas clay agar can also support gram positive and yeast hence it is it is better than uh, mekong ke agar especially for urine specimen and <coughs> They say that if you use clay agar, there is no no uh, there is no no uh, no need to use blood agar also because it has a it has an advantage over blood agar that is it prevents proteus swarming. Blood agar there is swarming of proteus, whereas in clay agar there is no swarming of proteus. It will it will prevent the swarming of proteus. So this is the advantage of clay agar over blood agar. So they say that for urine specimen, either you use a combination of blood agar and mekong agar. Otherwise, you can just use clay agar, which can serve the purpose of both blood agar and mekong agar. So that is why in the lab where the urine specimen sample load is very high, they prefer to use a clay agar alone than to use a combination of blood agar and mekong agar. So this is the, these are the various type of media. <coughs> then the media used for anaerobic culture. Example is Robertson cooked broth uh, meat extract. Uh, Robertson cooked meat broth, RCM broth is for anaerobic sample. Neomycin blood agar. Then brain heart infusion agar supplement. A supplement like vitamin K, amin, these two are used as a supplement. That is brain heart infusion agar with as for supplement uh, such as the vitamin K and amin. All these are various anaerobic medium. Egg yolk agar, egg yolk agar is another example of anaerobic medium. Similarly, medium used for blood culture. For blood culture. Brain heart infusion agar and broth is used. <coughs> blood culture is done in blood culture bottle. Blood culture bottles. And there are two types of blood culture bottle monophagic and biphagic. Monophagic blood culture uh, bottle will have only liquid medium that is brain heart infusion broth. Whereas biphagic blood culture bottles will have a solid slant and also liquid medium. The solid slant is brain heart infusion agar and the liquid medium is brain heart infusion broth. Okay. So monophagic and biphagic media of, uh, that is used for blood culture bottle, they are nothing but composed of brain heart infusion broth and agar. The media used for antibiotic susceptibility test. For antibiotic susceptibility test, Muller Hinton agar is used. MH. Muller Hinton agar is used for antibiotic susceptibility test. Okay, so these are the various culture media. Now I will tell you the methods to create anaerobiosis. Anaerobiosis can be created by various ways. Like, for example, by displacement of oxygen. This is done by Macintosh field jar. This is the old method, whereas advanced uh, method is by using a specific instrument called as anapsomat instrument, which can displace the oxygen and it will replace by adding hydrogen. Apart from that, by various Chemical reaction to to combust the oxygen. Example is gas pack uh, system by using anaerobic glow box. 
of a specialized media called as press. Press media is nothing but it's a pre-reduced anaerobic sterilized media. Pre-reduced anaerobic sterilized media. This uh, this kind of media also is used to uh, uh, provide anaerobic environment. Fine. There are various culture methods. Like for example, strict culture is used for culturing the sample, inoculating the sample in uh, the various culture media. It is a it is a it is a routine method used for inoculating the specimen sample in various uh, culture media. Strict culture, lawn culture or carpet culture. This is used for antibiotic susceptibility test. Antibiotic susceptibility test on Mudar Indanagar, lawn culture or carpet culture is used. Apart from that, there is other, there are other uh, uh, culture method like stroke culture, staff culture. All these are the staff culture is used for triple sugar and a medium. Manitol motility at uh, medium. Stroke culture is used for citrate and urease medium. Okay, so there are various. In fact, in uh, triple sugar and test, a combination of stab and stroke both is used. Okay, triple sugar and test, both stab culture and stroke culture both are used combinedly. Okay, so these are the various culture methods available. Now I tell you about the automated culture system. Automated culture system like Bactech. Battery alert, ESP system, midget. All these are various automated culture system for bacterial culture. They will they will continuously monitor the bacterial growth automated fashion. Bactech uses radiometric principle to detect the bacterial growth. Battery alert uses fluorescent principle to detect the bacterial growth. Whereas ESP system uses the manometry to detect the present difference, to detect the present difference when the bacteria grows and produces uh, the carbon dioxide. Midget is mycobacterial growth indicator tube. Mycobacterial growth indicator tube it is used for growth and detection of mycobacterium tuberculosis. And it is also based upon the fluorescent based principles. Okay, so these are the various automated culture systems available. Now I will tell you something about the molecular method, especially PCR polymerase chain reaction. There are various molecular methods, and the most important is PCR or polymerase chain reaction developed by Carey B. Mullis. Carey B. Mullis and this is a method by which you can amplify as a single copy of DNA into millions of copies and PCR has got three basic steps first is DNA extraction second step is amplification of the extracted DNA third is visualization of extracted DNA by doing a gel electrophoresis DNA extraction, amplification of the extracted DNA, then visualization of the amplified DNA by doing gel electrophoresis. DNA extraction is done by various uh, methods by lysozyme method, proteinase K method, boiling. All these are various uh, methods to extract the DNA. Once the DNA is extracted, of course, you know that the bacterial DNA is double standard DNA. So the next step is amplification step. It has got three basic uh, components. First is denaturation. So that the double standard DNA is separated into two single strands. And this is done at higher temperature that is around 90 to 95 degrees centigrade. Denaturation. Third is uh, I mean, Second is annealing of primer. Annealing of primer. 
सो प्राइमर्स आर नथिंग बट दे आर स्मॉल न्यूक्लियोटाइड सिक्वेंसेस कॉम्प्लीमेंट्री टू द रेस्पेक्टिव पार्ट ऑफ बैक्टीरियल डीएन सो यू हैव टू एड द स्पेसिफिक प्राइमर्स against the bacteria which you are suspecting in the clinical sample so for example if you are suspecting hemophilus influenza dna in in csf of a case of meningitis so in such case you have to add specific h influenza uh, primers if you add a different primer then the amplification will not take place so anything of the primer is the most specific step of a pcr okay so primer will get annealed to the specific part of bacterial dna third step is extension step extension step is done by a by adding dna polymerase by adding dna polymerase you have to add a specific type of dna polymerase called as tag polymerase tag polymerase is a dna polymerase extracted from a plant called as thermus aquaticus plant thermus aquaticus plant and this tag polymerase has a property of withstanding a <coughs> uh, withstanding higher temperatures of a amplification step, uh, cycle so tag polymerase is added and this tag polymerase the role is it will keep on adding nucleotides you also have you also have to add a nucleotide to the medium so you have to add tag polymerase plus you have to add nucleotide the role of the tag polymerase is the tag polymerase what it will do is it will keep on adding the nucleotide at the growing end of the primer it will keep on adding the nucleotide at the growing end of the primer so that at the at the end of the extension step you will produce two double stranded dns so uh, so this is one step of amplification uh, this is one cycle of amplification so like that there are 30 to 35 cycles which will keep on going so that at the end of the amplification there are millions of copies of amplicons which will be generated and they are so the there are various modifications of pcr first is reverse transcriptase pcr pcr detects dna or rna pcr amplifies the dna if you want to amplify the rna you have to do a reverse transcriptase PCR which will amplify the RNA. Similarly, the next PCR is multiplex PCR, where more than one primer of different organism responsible for same clinical syndrome are added. So, multiplex PCR is used for syndromic approach. Uh, for example, if you are suspecting meningitis then you you add multiplex as uh, uh, they do a multiplex uh, pcr where you can use more than one primer of common organisms of uh, responsible for uh, many, uh, meningitis like hemophilus influenza pneumococcus meningococcus all the common uh, organism the respective primers you can add so that whichever bacterial dna is there in the clinical sample the respective primer will anneal and will get amplified so this is multiplex pcr which is used for syndromic approach third is nested pcr where it is a two round of pcr each round we we use one primer each so two primers are used and to make two round of pcr first you do a pcr Round one, where you are using primer one, and the amplified product, you are subjected to one more PCR by using a second primer, and both the second primer is targeted against the same organism, but a different genetic sequence. so that it will increase the specificity of the reaction and because it is a double round amplification it is more sensitive than a conventional pcr also but the but the problem of nested pcr is you are opening the vial 
multiple times hence there is more risk of contamination so this is a drawback of nested species otherwise it is highly specific because you are doubly checking the organisms dna sequence by using two different primer targeting the same organism and as well as it is highly sensitive because the amplified product of the first dna is subjected to a second round of amplification so that more ampli uh, more amplicons are produced hence it is highly sensitive also last but not the list is real time pcr pcr is the conventional pcr is is uh, quantitative or qualitative of course it is qualitative the, the conventional pcr can detect only the presence or absence of dna it cannot say how much of dna is there so to quantify real time pcr is done please remember it is done for quantification hence it is useful for monitoring the response to treatment especially hiv hepatitis b you it is useful for monitoring the response to antiretroviral drug in case of hiv <coughs> and please remember here you are doing real time visualization of amplification please remember the basic difference between a conventional pcr and a real time pcr is conventional pcr you will know that amplification has taken place or not only after the end of gel electrophoresis after that if you can see the bands then you can say that yes amplification had taken place whereas in real time pcr while the amplification is going on you can visualize the amplification at a real time basis uh, that is why it is much faster than the conventional pcr and of course it is higher sensitive and higher specific than conventional pcr and also there is less chance of contamination as compared to a conventional pcr as real time pcr is the future of microbiology now it is the most sophisticated uh, molecular method which can be used for diagnostic microbiology so this finishes this chapter next we will discuss about the bacterial genetics okay 1.4 bacterial genetics bacterial genetics first is we will discuss uh, uh, what are the various methods of gene transfer various methods of bacterial dna transfer the bacterial gene can be transferred by various methods it can be clubbed as transformation transduction and conjugation transformation transduction and bacterial conjugation transformation is a method of transfer of bacterial genes by agency of free dna they say that the free dna produced after the bacterial death they are uptaken by the surrounding bacteria okay if the bacteria dies the dna will be released outside which will be are taken up by the surrounding bacteria this is called as transformation just the free dna will be taken up and griffith experiment which was done in 1930s this was done in mice for demonstrating the transformation of pneumococcus and this is a uh, the uh, griffith experiment is done to demonstrate the transformation and he has used mice and pneumococcal strains he has used to uh, demonstrate the transformation the transduction is a transfer of bacterial gene from one bacteria to other by the help of bacteriophages you know that the bacteriophage are the viruses that infect a bacteria so if this is a bacteria and if this is a bacterial chromosome then there are certain bacteriophages that can infect a bacteria so a bacteriophage when they infect a bacteria the phage dna goes inside and it gets integrated with the bacterial dna 
So this is called as lysogenic conversion. Uh, this is called as lysogenic uh, conversion. That is the phase DNA goes inside the bacterial cell and it gets integrated with the bacterial DNA. So in this case, when the phase DNA is detached, after some time the phase DNA gets detached to come to the cytoplasm. So when the phase DNA is detached, it may take the adjacent bacterial DNA along with it. Okay? So when the phase DNA gets detached, it may take the adjacent bacterial DNA along with it. Such phase DNA when it infects another bacterial cell, then it gets integrated with the bacterial chromosome so that the the bacterial DNA from the first cell can go to the second cell. So this is called as transduction by which the transfer of bacterial DNA from one bacteria to other bacteria by help of bacteriophage. A transduction is of two types, generalized transduction and restricted uh, transduction. Restricted transduction is the method by which the phage takes up the adjacent DNA. Okay, the only the adjacent DNA if the phase will take up it is called as restricted transduction. But a generalized transduction is a method by which the phase can take up any DNA from the bacterial chromosome. Any DNA, any DNA, maybe from maybe from any site, the part of the DNA can be taken up by the uh, bacterial phase. This is called a generalized transduction. One more variety is lysogenic conversion. <laughs> Lysogenic conversion, as I told you, this is a method by which the phage DNA, this is a, this is a bacteriophage, so the phage will infect the bacteria and the phage DNA gets integrated with the bacterial chromosome. This is called as lysogenic conversion, I have already explained you. And in this case, the phase DNA being foreign in nature, it may gives the various property to the bacteria and one of the important properties is toxigenicity. Please uh, remember, there are various phage coded toxins which impact toxigenicity to the bacteria. I have already explained you earlier, they are abbreviated as A, B, C, D, E, like A and C toxin of streptococcus pyrogenic ectotoxin A and C streptococcus pyrogenic ectotoxin A and C botulinum toxin C and D cholera toxin diphtheria toxin and enterohemorrhagic E. coli virocytotoxin enterohemorrhagic E. coli virocytotoxin so please remember there are 5 toxins which are coded by bacteriophage and during the lysogenic conversion stage, the bacteriophage coded toxins impact toxigenicity property to the bacteria. So this is called as lysogenic conversion. Now I will tell you about bacterial conjugation. Conjugation is a, is a method by transfer of bacterial DNA from one bacteria to other by the formation of conjugation tube. And the conjugation tube which is formed, it is coded by a plasmid called as F factor. Okay? And bacteria which carries F factor, they are called as F plus or male bacteria. They are the bacteria which carries F factor and F factor is uh, nothing but it is a plasmid which codes for the conjugation tube. F factor is a plasmid which codes for the uh, conjugation tube. So such F plus or male bacteria when it, when it comes close with, with another uh, bacteria which is lacking the F factor, F minus uh, bacteria. Only the only the chromosome will be there, but there is no plasmid outside. So F minus bacteria when they come close with F plus a bacteria, the F factor forms a conjugation tube. First, the F factor forms a conjugation tube. Then uh, second step is the F factor gets multiplied, duplicated, and the third step is 
a copy of f vector goes to the female vector so after the conjugation is over f minus bacterial gets converted to f plus bacteria because f minus bacteria attains the f vector and it becomes f plus bacteria so this is the usual method of bacterial uh, conjugation and 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 along with f vector if certain other resistance gene or certain other virulent genes can also go to the recipient bacteria okay so if only f vector goes then f minus cell will become f plus cell along with f vector if certain virulent gene or certain drug resistant gene if it goes to the female uh, bacteria then along with attaining the f vector it also attain the resistant genes as well as the virulent genes so bacterial conjugation is a, 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 is a method by which we can transfer the genes from one bacteria to a, 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 to other bacteria by the formation of conjugation tube okay next is what is hfr state so here i want to explain you that this is bacterial uh, chromosome and uh, this is f vector sometime what happens is the f plasmid gets integrated with the bacterial chromosome sometimes the f plasmid gets integrated with the bacterial uh, chromosome this state is called as hfr state high frequency recombination state wow well, high frequency recombination state uh, the uh, the meaning of this is when a female bacterium having only the chromosome comes close to a hfr cell hfr uh, bacteria then this is a state where the recombination occurs more frequently there is more chance of formation of the conjugation tube f vector will form the uh, conjugation tube and the frequency of recombination is more but but the problem is because it is in an integrated state so when f vector gets duplicated and a copy of f vector goes to the female uh, bacterium and it takes a longer time to complete the procedure uh, because the f vector is in an integrated state so before the procedure is completed often the conjugation tube is broken before the f vector completely goes to the f minus cell often the conjugation tube is broken hence they say that the f minus cell usually they are not able to become f plus cell in hfr state so please remember hfr state is a state where f vector is in the integrated form with the bacterial chromosome and in this state the chance of free, uh, the, the frequency of recombination between the cell is more hence it is called as high frequency recombination state however though the frequency of recombination is more the f vector does not go completely to the recipient cell hence the f minus cell usually they do not become f plus cell. so this is the meaning of hfr state high frequency recombination next is what is f dash cell what is f dash cell f dash means what <coughs> this is the hfr state this is the vector chromosome and this is the f vector so this is a hfr state after some time the f vector will be detached from the bacterial uh, chromosome f vector will be detached from the bacterial uh, chromosome and it will come to the cytoplasm so when f vector from a hfr state when the f vector gets detached and comes to the cytoplasm it may carry the adjacent bacterial genes adjacent chromosomal genes along with it this state is called as f dead state f dead state it is a state where f vector comes back to the cytoplasm along with it it carries a certain bacterial chromosomes along with this such f dead bacteria when it comes close contact with the f minus a bacteria then what happens the f vector forms the conjugation tube and the entire thing gets duplicated along with the bacterial chromosome along with the chromosomal gene 
the entire thing gets duplicated and a copy goes to the female bacteria so that at the end of conjugation the f factor goes along with that the bacterial genes also they go to the female bacteria and many of these bacterial genes may be the virulent gene or may be the drug resistant gene also so please remember when a f dash cell meet with f minus cell the resultant cell will be a f dash cell because it will it will have a the the result the resultant recipient cell will have f factor as well as it will have bacterial genes also surrounding to it so the recipient cell actually will receive at f dash factor hence the recipient cell will become f dash cell. so please remember i want to conclude here by saying that when f plus cell match with f minus cell the resultant recipient will be f plus when a hfr state match with f minus cell the mating is more frequent however the resultant cell remains f minus only when a f dash cell match with f minus cell when the f dash cell match with f minus cell the resultant cell will be f dash okay so the resultant recipient will be f dash so these are the three important outcome of conjugation what you need to remember it is very very important you will get confused in the exam okay <coughs> so this is all about bacterial conjugation now i will tell you a bit about transposons transposons they are discovered by barbara mcclintock and transposons are also called as jumping genes they usually jump between the bacterial chromosome and plasmids they are the jumping genes they usually jump between the between the bacterial chromosome and plasmids so this is a bacteria this is a bacterial chromosome and these are the plasmids that transposons are the small genetic elements very small small genetic elements very small small genetic elements sometimes they are uh, they are present on the bacterial uh, chromosome sometimes they jump to become a part of bacterial plasmid so they uh, they usually jump between the chromosome and the plasmid and they differ from plasmid by the way that they do not have independent replication they do not have independent uh, replication if, if the plas if the transposons are outside they cannot duplicate by themselves they can replicate only when they are integrated to bacterial chromosome or they are integrated to plasmid so they do not have bacterial uh, replication uh, they do not have independent uh, replication so transposons also they have importance in bacterial drug resistance they say that the various drug resistant genes are coded by transposons okay, so this is all about transposons okay now i will tell you the various methods of bacterial drug resistance there are various methods of bacterial drug resistance bacterial drug resistance first is by efflux pump mechanism this is the mechanism by which the drugs are transported out they say that in the bacterial cell membrane there are various efflux pump and the role of efflux pump is whichever antibiotic will come inside once the antibiotics will come inside they are transported out immediately by the efflux pump this is one mechanism second mechanism is by producing various enzymes like for example beta-lactamases beta-lactamases or by producing amino glycoside modifying enzymes amino glycoside modifying enzymes 
थर्ड मैकेनिज्म इज बाई ऑल्ट्रेशन ऑफ टारगेट साइट ऑल्ट्रेशन ऑफ टारगेट साइट ऑफ द ड्रग्स दिस इज दिस इज सोन बाई वेरियस ट्रेन लाइक एम आर एस ए वी आर एस ए बी आर ई ऑल दिस आर वेरियस ऑर्गेनिजम वेरियस बैक्टीरिया विच एक्जिबिट ड्रग इज इन दल्ट्रेशन ऑफ टारगेट साइट फॉर एग्जाम्पल इन इन एम आर एस ए द द टारगेट साइट ऑफ बिटल एक्टम एंटीबायोटिक यू ऑल नो द टारगेट साइट ऑफ बिटल एक्टम एंटीबायोटिक इज द पेनिसिलिन बाइंडिंग प्रोटीन पेनिसिलिन बाइंडिंग प्रोटीन आर द टारगेट साइट ऑफ बिटल एक्टम एंटीबायोटिक प्रेजेंट ऑन द बैक्टीरियल सेल वो द पेनिसिलिन बाइंडिंग प्रोटीन गेट्स ऑल्टेड टू पेनिसिलिन बाइंडिंग प्रोटीन टू ए एंड दिस ऑल्टेड प्रोटीन हैज गॉट लेस एफिनिटी फॉर बिटल एक्टम एंटीबायोटिक so mrsa are resistant to all bitter like antibiotic and this is because they undergo alteration of the target site for the bitter lactam that is the penicillin binding protein gets altered to penicillin binding protein 2a similarly vrsa again vrsa and vre the mechanism is same it is due to van gene and van gene what cause uh, what it does it it alters the target site of vancomycin the target site of of uh, vancomycin is dialanine dialanine sequence which is present in the bacterial cell wall it is a peptidoglycan side chain dialanine dialanine which is uh, present in the bacterial uh, peptidoglycan layer this gets altered to dialanine d lactate or dialanine d serine this altered protein has less affinity for vancomycin so this is a mechanism shown by van gene and van gene is expressed by vre that is vancomycin resistant enterococcus and vrsa that is vancomycin resistant staphylococcus aureus so all these are the various mechanism by which alteration of the target site is the principal mechanism of bacterial drug resistance okay now i will tell you about uh, something about vital actamases according to ambler classification the vital actamases can be classified into four groups esbl that is that is extended spectrum vital actamases mbl that is metallobital actamases and c bital actamases and the last one is oxacillinase this is not very important but the first three are very important for example extended spectrum bital actamases if the bacteria produces extended spectrum bital actamases enzyme then it is resistant to all penicillin plus first second third generation cephalosporins all penicillin plus first second third generation uh, uh, cephalosporins however this resistance can overcome by adding beta lactamase inhibitor uh, for example the uh, clavulinic acid or sulbactam If you add beta lactamase inhibitor like clavulinic acid or sulbactam, this resistance can be overcome. Next is AMC beta lactamase. AMC beta lactamase, the spectrum is ESBL spectrum. Plus, in in addition, it is resistant to cefamycins like cefoxetin and cefotita. Cefamycins like cefamycins like cefoxetin and cefotita plus the all the range of esbl organisms also uh, uh, e, e, uh, esbl spectrum of antibiotics also amc will be resistant and the peculiar is it is not overcome by adding beta lactamase inhibitor please remember addition of beta lactamase inhibitor is of no use 
the resistance the amc resistance is not overcome by addition of butyl actamase inhibitor next is metallobutyl actamase metallobutyl actamase the spectrum is amp c spectrum plus in addition it is resistant to carbapenems like meropenem and and imipenem and this resistance also is not overcome by addition of butyl actamase inhibitor so please remember metallobutyl actamases are resistant to amc spectrum plus carbapenem and which and it is not overcome by addition of butyl actamase inhibitor okay so in this context what they can ask is for esbl uh, producers the treatment option the treatment option if they ask for esbl uh, producer the treatment option is you can give kefamycin cefoxidine can be given carbapenem also can be given or other class can be given cefoxidin can be given carbapenem can be given or other class like for example aminoglycoside can be given whereas the treatment option for amc butyl actamase is either carbapenem or other class esbl one more treatment option is you can give uh, penicillin or cephalosporin plus adding a butyl actamase inhibitor you can add uh, penicillin uh, or uh, cephalosporin any of the spectrum can be given plus you can add butyl actamase inhibitor whereas butyl actamase inhibitor is not useful for amps you can give only uh, carbapenems or other class for amps butyl actamases whereas for metallo butyl actamases no butyl actam can be given the only treatment option is other class of antibiotic can be given like aminoglycoside so please remember there are four treatment option for esbl first is kefamycin second is carbapenem third is penicillin or or cefalosporin adding butyl actamase inhibitor or fourth is other class for amc butyl actamase you can give either carbapenem or other class you you, you cannot add a butyl actamase inhibitor for 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 metallobutyl actamases the only treatment option is other class like aminoglycoside or any other class of antibiotic but butyl actamase inhibitors you you cannot give or any of the butyl actamases including the carbapenems will not be effective because they are resistant okay so that finishes bacterial drug resistance